My name is Giulia Scarpaleggia. I am a Tuscan born and bred country girl, a home cook, a food writer and photographer. I teach Tuscan cooking classes in my house in the countryside and I've been sharing honest, reliable Italian recipes for 10 years now through my cookbooks and my blog, juicekitchen.com. If you love everything about Italian food, big crowded tables and seasonal ingredients, join us and follow Cooking with an Italian Accent. Ciao, Giulia. I loved your last podcast. And one of my favorite dishes that I make for my other half, Mark, is Malaredas alla Campadanesi. Um, it's a favorite dish from Sardinia when I spent a summer there. And my neighbor, Angeletta, used to make it for me when I'd go to hers for lunch. Thank you, Kate, from Cooking and Carafts for sharing with us the first meal that you prepare for your husband. And now, another news. A few days ago, I received an email from Katie from the Inner Sister podcast saying that she mentioned our Fagioli Lucelletto, so such meatballs cooked in stew beans, in their 50th episode. And that she mentioned also this podcast. It felt like when I received the first comment on the blog, so exciting. This podcast is really bringing me back to the first days of blogging. So thank you, Kate and Betsy, for welcoming me into this wonderful podcasting world. Make sure to follow Katie and Betsy and their podcast, The Dinner Sister Podcast. Welcome to Cooking with an Italian Accent, episode 3. Today we're going to talk about bread, but not any bread, the pane toscano, Tuscan bread. It is hard to talk about Tuscan cuisine without mentioning our bread, a loaf made without salt. In Tuscany, this bread is defined sciocco, which for us means insipid, bland, but for the rest of Italy it means silly. This bread has a crisp golden crust and a soft, dense crumb. No salt, no olive oil, no milk, butter or nuts. Just flour, water and natural yeast. Our bread, the Tuscan bread, is a D.O.P., Do you know what does it mean? Well, a DOP, which in English is a PDO, means a protected designation of origin. In Italy, we have 299 products that are either a DOP, an IGT, which means protected geographical indication, or an STG, which means traditional specialty guarantee. This is also the highest number in Europe, as our 299 products do not include wine, where we have 526 certified products. But now back to our bread. To be defined a DOP bread, this bread has to be made with Tuscan farina zero, so local flour, water, and sourdough starter, that we call either lievito madre or pasta acida. It is not easy to get used to this bland bread, i know, this is the first thing everyone mentions during a cooking class. The food here in Tuscany is exceptional, but what happened to the bread? For me and for everyone born in this land, though, for those who have been eating this bread since the early days, either with prosciutto, with jam, with tomato, with Nutella, or just with good olive oil and salt, this is the bread. The first time I realized my bread was different was when I was about, I think, 18, 19. It was the end of summer. I was in Cortona, near Arezzo, and I was there with other young people from all over Italy. It was an orientation for the university, so there were people coming from high schools from all over Italy, and we were staying together. So having breakfast together, having lunch together, dinner, talking, studying, and so on. And I remember at bre uh, breakfast time, there was our bread, our daily bread and I was so happy eating this bread with chocolate or with jam and everyone was like I don't like this bread this this is missing something and I was like yes it's missing the salt for me that was bread the, I didn't know any other kind of bread but for them that was really really unusual because it was really missing salt which gives flavor to bread but we are pretty proud of our bread historically made without salt. It was even mentioned by the father of our sweet language, Dante Alighieri, in the Divina Commedia, back in the early 18th century. 
talking about exile, he says, tu proverai si come sa di sale lo pane altrui, which means you're going to taste how salty it is the bread made by other people when you are not in your land. Our Tuscan bread is our flagship product. It's the perfect match to our extremely salty prosciutto, prosciutto toscano, or our salame, that find a delicious balance in the dense bread crumb of our pane shock. This is one of the reasons that explain the lack of salt in our bread. But of course, we have a legend as well. Legend says that Pisa would control the arrival of salt to Florence. So you have to know that in Tuscany, neighboring towns, they usually hate each other. It happens in Florence and Pisa, Florence and Siena, Pisa and Livorno. So it's, it's very normal. So back in the days, Florence didn't want to pay those taxes that Pisa had put on their salt. So they decided to make bread without salt. So let's talk about this bread now in these days. My grandmother says that she can give up on everything, but not on bread. She eats bread with meat or fish, with vegetables, to mop the sauce left in the bowl of the pasta, with fruit, for example with apples, and also on its own. Bread is definitely more important to her than the companatico, any kind of food that goes with bread, which is pane. And this roots back in the past times, when in the countryside they had abundance of bread, but not of something to eat with it. If you mention me bread, though, the first word that comes to my mind is merenda, which is the afternoon snack you usually have around 4 or 5 p.m. When you start to feel rather peckish and dinner's time is still far and lunch is just a faint memo. The question was invariably the same. What do you want with your bread? Could be pane olio or bruschetta or fettunta, so it was bread and olive oil. This, this would happen usually in autumn when we had a fresh olive oil. So the toasted bread would be rubbed with garlic and then dressed with a generous dash of freshly pressed olive oil and then a sprinkle of salt, of course. It was pane burro e zucchero. When my grandmother wanted to treat me with something sweet, it was bread and butter with a sprinkling of sugar or a thick layer of sticky golden honey on top. This was perfectly even for the morning breakfast. It was pane pomodoro. This is a summer favorite. In late summer came the time of tiny, ripe tomatoes rubbed generously onto the white bread, sprinkled with salt and dried oregano and a drizzle of good olive oil to finish. It was fresh and fruity. I cannot recall a better snack, especially when the tomatoes came directly from my grandmother's garden, still warm from the summer sun. Nowadays, this is often dinner for my grandmother. And there's also another merenda, which now is not common anymore, which is pane e vino. So bread and wine. Uh, my grandmother says that when she was a kid, she would have this for merenda. So a slice of bread and a few drops of red wine. The last image I have from my childhood is about the way the bread was cut. Forget cutting board and table. They used to lay a dishcloth or a napkin on their shoulder rest a huge bread loaf on their chest and slice it masterfully, sliding the knife toward themselves. I can see my granddad Remigio slicing the bread for me with a thick slice. And then he would cut the crust into small bites and he would call them pecorine, little sheep. And then he would wrap each one of the little pecorine in prosciutto. That could be a merenda, that could be an antipasto for the evening, that could be dinner sometimes. But that was the sweetest love sign from my grandfather making the bread child-friendly and fun. And now we come to the role of stale bread as the staple ingredient of Tuscan cooking. Consider that the bread was made in large wheels once in a week and often baked in shared ovens or, as it happened in my family decades ago, in a wood-burning oven just outside our farmhouse. Remember that the bread is made without salt. So what happens? The bread becomes stale after a few days, but then it doesn't become moldy because it is the salt that attracts the humidity. So we have a bread which is not as fresh as at the beginning, which gets slightly uh, stale after a few days and then it becomes hard as a rock. It, it really can, you can knock it on the, on the table. It's very hard, it's difficult to slice it. But then you can bring it back to a new life. And how can you do that? 
water. You can immerse the bread in water, cold water. The bread becomes like a sponge. And then you can squeeze it, you remove all the excess water, and you crumble the bread in your recipe. This is how you can reuse Tuscan bread, which is even you know, 15 days old. There are many recipes that have stale bread as the key ingredient in our Tuscan cuisine. Let's start with the first one, and I'm sure that you have already heard about this, panzanella. Panzanella is a tomato and cucumber salad that we often make during summer. But it is very different from the panzanella that you would usually find in your country. It is not made with bread croutons. The bread, as I was telling you before, is soaked in water and then is squeezed to remove all the water and crumbled in a bowl. Then this bread is seasoned with tomatoes, cucumbers, basil, fresh onion, and then extra virgin olive oil, salt, pepper, and vinegar. It's so refreshing in summer. Its uniqueness lies in this subtle note of vinegar, which tickles your appetite and cools you down even in the hottest summer, binding together tomatoes, cucumbers, and onions. The other recipe that I really love, it's my comfort food, is pappa al pomodoro. Pappa is the name that we usually use to define baby food or food for pets, so it's something very easy to eat. Pappa al pomodoro is a tomato bread soup. Cooking class after cooking class, summer after summer, I came to my own version, which sits right in the middle in between Florence and Siena, just like me, just like the Valdelsa, where I live. My papal pomodoro has just a bunch of ingredients. It has fresh tomatoes, it has, of course, stale bread, garlic, salt, basil, and your best extra virgin olive oil. How do you make this? To make the papal pomodoro, you have to fry some garlic in olive oil, Then you add a bunch of tomatoes. I like fresh peeled tomatoes, but you can also use pelati from a jar. And then you cook quickly uh, the tomatoes for about five minutes, eight minutes. Then you have the bread, the bread that has been soaked and squeezed. And you have to stir the bread into the tomatoes. I often use not a wooden spoon, but a whisk, because I want my papal pomodoro to be very creamy. So... um, This is basically the recipe. You just have to add now salt, of course, basil, and almost a glass of extra virgin olive oil. And then you have to let it sit for a while so that all the flavors would mingle and it becomes the best comfort food in summer. The other recipe is a um, flagship recipe of Tuscan cuisine. My grandmother calls it minestra di pane, which is a bread soup again, but it is known also as ribollita. The name ribollita tells you everything about how this recipe is made. At the beginning, you have a very simple vegetable soup with beans, cannellini beans usually, and with cavolo nero, our Tuscan kale. Then you have other vegetables, could be carrots, celery, onion. Well, when the soup is ready, you layer bread in a bowl with this soup. So you have a layer of bread, stale bread, a layer of soup, a layer of bread, a layer of soup. This is the actual minestra di pane that my grandmother makes. The day after, because you always have leftovers, the day after you have to reboil. So you have to cook again the ribollita. And this is how you got this very famous recipe. Sometimes it is cooked in a cast iron pan until it's almost crisp. On the bottom and this is the real ribollita. Another recipe is acqua cotta. Acqua cotta means cooked water but it is basically an onion and tomato soup. It is a typical soup of maremma and it's also another good example of peasant cooking along with many other recipes that have as a main ingredient stale bread and some seasonal vegetables. It is a nomad dish that follows the people from the mountain Amiata who moved in winter to the plain of Maremma in search of work bringing with them a few ingredients, among which there were always onions. Even this soup is poured over some stale bread. And sometimes you can even make this richer by poaching an egg into the soup or grating some pecorino on top of this egg. These are the typical traditional recipes from Tuscany that use stale bread. But of course, there are many other recipes that you can make with stale bread. Just think about a bread pudding cake, where you just cook the bread 
in milk and then you add eggs and sugar, sometimes chocolate, sometimes nuts or raisins, and then you bake it. It's a delicious cake for breakfast. Another recipe is a stuffed roast chicken. The stale bread is mixed with fresh sausages, for example, and it becomes a flavorful filling for a festive roast chicken. Stale bread is also a very important ingredient in meatballs because you soak the bread in milk and then you add it to the ground meat. And so the meatballs become immediately softer. If you don't have stale bread, you can use boiled potatoes or sometimes, as I have on my blog, eggplants or butternut squash. There's also another use of stale bread, which is actually very basic, but it's breadcrumbs. So with stale bread, you can make breadcrumbs. My grandmother has two different kinds of breadcrumbs, homemade breadcrumbs. She has the very fine one that she uses to coat cutlets, for example, to fry them. And then she has the most precious one, which is the coarse breadcrumbs. She uses these breadcrumbs to sprinkle over vegetables when she wants to bake them, or she uses them for a stuffing for chicken, as I was mentioning before, or also for vegetables. And this reminds me also of another use of stale bread, which is actually more typical of the south of Italy. Not very much here in Tuscany, but it is something that I really love. So fried breadcrumbs, frying the breadcrumbs in olive oil, sometimes with garlic or fresh herbs, is defined the Parmigiano poor people. Because instead of sprinkling parmesan on pasta, you can sprinkle these fried breadcrumbs and it becomes delicious. But let's have a look at bread today. Tuscan bread belongs to our culture. It is part of who we are. Now I'm telling you something that could make me lose my Tuscan citizenship, I'm sure. Tuscan bread is not my favorite bread. I'm working with sourdough to make whole wheat bread, using different flours, introducing seeds and salt. I like to experiment to understand bread better. When I make my brown bread and share it with my grandmother, she always tells me, I don't know why you want to make brown bread when it took us years to afford the white bread. Actually, this is totally understandable from the perspective of someone born in the countryside who has always seen brownish food as the food of poor people, and white food, think about sugar, think about refined flour, as the food of rich ones. Still, there's no pappa al pomodoro, or ribollita, or panzanella without the Tuscan bread. So even though I make brown bread most of the times, playing with flowers and seeds and with sourdough, I still buy Tuscan bread at the bakery once in a while, and I just let it go stale and so that I can use that to make my favorite recipes, and especially in summer when I can make panzanella or when I can make pappa al pomodoro. Word of the day. Learn the Italian language of food word after word. Every year, more than 200 people join our cooking classes. Speaking with them, I made a small dictionary of important words and pronunciations that can help you navigate through the immense world of Italian food. So if you love Italian language as much as you love Italian cooking, these are a few words that can be useful for you. Today's word is related to bread, and it is bruschetta. So what is a bruschetta? Bruschetta is a slice of bread that is toasted, uh, where... (laughs) In the past times, but even when I was a child, it was toasted next to the fireplace in a, on a griddle pan. And that was the best toasted bread ever because you had all the smell and the flavor of the wood. Growing up, the bruschetta now is made on the stove top, either in a cast iron pan or in a normal, very simple non-stick pan. I toast the bread on both sides until I see some signs of burnt bread. I like it very toasted. So once the bread is toasted, you usually rub it with garlic, with a clove of garlic, and then you pour your best extra virgin olive oil on top. If you like it, a few sprinkling of salt. That's the basic bruschetta, uh, which is called also fettunta, like a greased slice of bread in Florence. But now bruschetta means almost everything like every toasted slice of bread with something on top. You can have a bruschetta with tomatoes, you can have a bruschetta with some cheese and some peppers, for example, or you can have a bruschetta with a vegetable spread. But the important thing now 
is the pronunciation. How to spell it? Bruschetta is B R U S C H E double T A. So it is not bruschetta. Why? You must read C H in Italian as K. So it is bruschetta. This is the end of the third episode of our podcast, Cooking with an Italian Accent. I'd love to hear from you. Have you ever baked or tried Tuscan bread? Was it a surprise when you first tried it in Tuscany? But also, which is your relationship with bread? Is it fundamental for you as for us in Tuscany? Or is it just something that you happen to eat? Share it with me via email or with a post or a story on Instagram using the hashtag cooking with an Italian accent and tagging Jules Kitchen. If you have questions about Italian and Tuscan cooking, just email me at jules at juleskitchen.com or join our Facebook group, Cooking with Jules Kitchen. I'll answer your questions at the end of each episode. Thanks for listening to Cooking with an Italian Accent. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes or wherever you are listening to a podcast. Rate and review the show. It will help us to be found online and build up our appetite for Italian food. Share with your friends too. You will find all the links to the recipes we mentioned today in this episode description. Don't forget to visit juleskitchen.com for more information and to discover new stories and recipes from Tuscany. Ciao!